So, good morning and uh, welcome to our session, uh, discussion on uh, Welsh birds, names and knowledge. Uh, our project is uh, eWorld, the Ethno-Ornithology World Archive, and uh, the, the function of our, our, our project, the archive that we're creating, is to connect communities of birds and people. Um, uh, with me to uh, discuss these things and with the audience as well, um, if we have one. <laughs> uh, I'm Andy Gosler, I'm the, the, the director of the project and the, the principal investigator. Uh, with me is Daniel Jenkins-Jones, who's head of public affairs for the RSPB in Wales, um, and has particular knowledge uh, of um, uh, particular knowledge of, of uh, the Welsh, uh, well, knowledge of birds. Um, and John Fanshaw, my colleague, is a consultant to the uh, EWA project, uh, works for BirdLife International. Um, I want to start with a question. I want to pose a question uh, which may or not uh, connect with, with people here. Um, you may know the, the uh, nursery rhyme, Who Killed Cock Robin? And, um, uh, I have a, an interesting answer to this. Uh, you might, might think uh, it's I said a sparrow with my bow and arrow, but we have a recent, a recent uh, take on this. Uh, a recent um, poll uh, showed that the, the British people have voted the blue tit as their favourite bird for the first time in history. For the first time in history, knocking the robin off its perch as Britain's favourite bird. And you might think, so just in case anyone doesn't know what a blue tit is, he's a blue tit. Um, and you might think, oh, well, that's a pretty bird, maybe it's prettier than a robin, and maybe that has no, no more significance than, well, it's just another bird. Uh, but actually, uh, we think this, this might have some quite deep cultural significance. Uh, the relationship that people have with robins is quite different from the relationship that people have with blue tits. Um, so robins hop around you when you're digging the garden, uh, they might even come and sit on your, on your fork and when you're about to sit your foot on the, on the fork and, and, uh, and they'll be hopping around, uh, picking up insects and, and worms. Very trusting. They, they, tr they seem to trust the human who's digging the garden. You have quite an intimate relationship with a robin and, and a real engagement, a two-way engagement. The relationship people have with blue tits is quite different. Blue tits are birds that you watch on a feeder, uh, on peanuts, through a window, through a screen. It's almost a virtual reality. Or, actually, it is an engagement through a screen. If you have one of these nest box cameras and you're watching what's going on, the sort of spring watch experience. Um, so, in, in fact, people are relating to blue tits through a screen a virtual reality, whereas people related to robins directly. And I think that's quite a significant shift and, and maybe behind uh, the reason for this, this uh, change of the favorite bird. Now that, that shift from a direct engagement to a sort of virtual engagement uh, is wrapped up with a general loss of knowledge uh, in the community at large in the country at large, of direct engagement uh, with birds. And I know from my own research at Oxford that, that um, well, actually, the risk of embarrassing uh, people, uh, half of our first year biology students um, can't name five British birds in a free listing exercise and can't recognize a blackbird. And uh, there's people in the audience shaking their head, but I can tell you it's the same at Cambridge. <laughs> and it's the same at Birmingham. Uh, so this isn't a specifically Oxford problem. The point is that that knowledge is folk knowledge. It's not taught formal educational knowledge, and it's certainly not part of the degree. But it does mean that we're, when we're lecturing about blue tits or red half of our audience don't actually know what we're talking about. And that's, that's uh, very important. Um, but the issue has, has more uh, cultural concern. And I'd like to bring Daniel, uh, Daniel in to talk a bit more about um, the research that the RSPB has been doing on this disconnectedness from nature. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Andy. So uh, one of the biggest threats really to, uh, to nature is this disconnection with, uh, with nature in the, the young generation at the moment. Uh, and it's, uh, it's particularly bad here in Wales, unfortunately, 
So many of the Welsh bird names that uh, that we have, uh, uh, is, is, the, the Welsh bird names are, are not dissimilar to the uh, English bird names or kind of uh, any of the bird names for, for across the world. Really, in, in terms of where they stem from, you know, they come from the culture that when people actually interact very very closely uh, with uh, with birds and with nature. So. Uh, you know, most of the birds in Wales, like most of the birds in England, are a whole host of various names based on local localities and local communities. Um, if we were to ask the question whether we were going to start naming Welsh birds again in the future from scratch, let's say that we were going to get rid of all the Welsh bird names and we we're going to start from scratch, I think we would have a very, very poor collection of Welsh bird names because of, uh, people in Wales have, have lost that connection with, uh, with nature. Why do I say that? I as we be a scientific organisation, we like to base everything on science. So we, uh, we, we measure this disconnection uh, uh, from nature, uh, from money funded by money from the Gulbenkian Foundation, working with the University of Essex. And uh, uh, we set about uh, looking at uh, how people interact with, uh, with nature, and particularly how young people interact with nature. And we came up with four net measures, the enjoyment of nature, uh, empathy for creatures, sense of oneness, sense of responsibility, and we, um, we measure children's responses uh, against those. Um, um, very sad to say is that in Wales, the connection with nature is, has the lowest score across the whole of the UK. Uh, only 13% of people, of young people, aged to 12 year olds in Wales, have a connection with nature that the RSBB deems to be a, a connection that is uh, like a living connection, uh, uh, a life enhancing uh, Connection, uh, and we know that there's kind of other kind of, uh, well-being issues when children lose connection with nature in terms of their ability to uh, communicate with others, um, their health, well-being, of course, uh, and even their ability to, to do well in school. Uh, and the, the particular sad thing about this in Wales is that the score is 13%. Uh, in uh, London, I think it's about 24%. Uh, and in Northern Ireland it's 27%. So the connection with nature, with young people in Wales, uh, uh, is, is, is half that of the rest of the UK. And uh, it, um, interestingly, across the, the whole spectrum, of Wales, uh, not Wales, sorry, the UK as a whole, uh, children in an urban environment score a higher connection with nature than children in a rural environment. Why is that? I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> The next, that's the next step for the RSP is to find out what we can do to address that. But kind of bringing it back to this kind of to, to the type of, of, of our talk here today, our discussion here today is, you know, there's there's that. It's Welsh bird names come from that deep interaction, uh, that living alongside birds. Um, and as say you've got you've got several examples, aren't they, uh, uh, in terms of the, the English names, uh, names like. Um, uh, Wasa uh, the the, med, uh, the, um, the cuckoo servant, uh, and that come, that's the name for the meadow cricket in Wales. And I gather it's the name for the rhinebeck uh, in England. So I don't know how the English word these things. But, but, well, but, I think, but, I think but, it's actually a Welsh Welsh name. Is the the rhinebeck? Uh, because the cuckoo servant. But um, well, well, uh, cuckoo's maiden, cuckoo's servant are English folk names as well as the meadow cricket. But it comes from that interaction with. So that if you were to look at a meadow pippin from scratch, if you were a young child now looking at a meadow pippin and you were uh, having an undertaking exercise and saying, name that bird, yeah. you would never call it Guasa Cuckoo. You would never call it with the Cuckoo Servant because you have to be out there in nature seeing a, a meadow pippin on the back of a juvenile cuckoo, feeding it, yes. and then trying to work out it in kind of in very unscientific terms, you know, where that interaction is. So you, you, Kind of come to the conclusion, yeah, that's, that's the cuckoo serving because you can see it feeding its young. So it's, it's fascinating as there is a whole host of other names like that. Yeah. Perhaps we should just, just say for our wider audience if anyone is watching this and, and doesn't know that cuckoos lay their eggs in other birds' nests and the meadow pipit is a, a particular host for the cuckoo. So to, to name the meadow pipit the cuckoo serving means you know that, you, you have that intimate knowledge. And, and many bird watchers would never have actually seen seen that so you know really exactly we're, we're, we're going right. down to the days of pre binoculars yeah. you now how close would these people have been to nature mm -hmm. to have been able to appreciate that is absolutely incredible and um, you know i don't think we'll ever go back to those days um, but uh, we have to do what we can well we can dream can't we dream, yeah. and 
And have, have you any, any thoughts on, on how we might help to reconnect people? That's the big challenge really for, for the Irish people at the moment. It's get them young, really. It's get, it's get young people in, uh, interested in nature. Uh, and that is, um, we have a fantastic field teachers program uh, across the Irish people reserves. That's deep meaningful, but with a very small number of people, young people. Uh, and uh, we, we continue to do that, but really we have to try and engage uh, young people here in Wales. We ask for across the UK and world uh, uh, on a far broader, probably shallow, shallower level, but just to sow that seed and that interest and talk to them and introduce them to nature, and hopefully that will kind of grow then and flourish in years to come. Well, thank you. I think it's a, it's a good point to bring John into the, the discussion. I've been sitting waiting patiently. So John works for BirdLife International, uh, which is a, a global organisation of which the RSPB is one uh, partner. Uh, BirdLife is working in 126 countries uh, worldwide, and they are a partner, a partner organisation for the Ethnomorphology World Archive. And because the, the World Archive is about um, collecting and sharing uh, things like these folk names of birds, like the Welsh uh, folk names, but from potentially 7,000 languages. Um, well, not quite, because some have gone extinct already, but, but uh, that's, that's how many uh, languages, roughly, there were um, globally. Um, and we find that, that same intimacy of knowledge uh, in the folk names of diverse cultures around the world. And uh, perhaps, uh, John, if you'd like to, to say something about bird life's sort of global perspective on what we've been talking about. Well, I mean, it picks up very much on, on what Daniel's been saying already about um, the situation in, in the UK. The RSPB has been found in many of the bird life partners in other countries, such as Audubon in the United States and Nature Canada in Canada, are finding a similar problem of the disconnect. And in fact, it was the American author Richard Lure who coined this idea of nature deficit disorder where um, you know, children are increasingly disconnected from nature. So a lot of the, uh, some of the early discussions came out of the US. And again, I think there's, a, there's an uncertainty about the, the reasons behind this, apart from the obvious concerns about self and, uh, health and safety and how children are increasingly protected from going outside and schools and things are concerned about all those sorts of issues. But I mean, turning a bit away from what you might call the UK, Western Europe and so on, the other major challenge to us, which is in true of almost all of the countries that BirdLife is working in or where we have partners, is growing urbanisation. So we estimate by 2050, I think the UN estimates that 70% of the world's population will be living in cities. And this, 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 this draining of the countryside of people into urban areas is a, is a major issue for us as well. So whether or not it's um, the direct cause, which I think you know, we can see from the statistics in the UK, you know, the, the balance between knowledge in, in urban and non-urban areas is very similar. But there's no doubt that this um, people being removed from nature is an issue right the way across the whole bird life family, bird life partnership. And my own personal experience, I'm just thinking that I work mostly in East Africa, and if you think about a city like Nairobi, which was has one of the greatest almost urban national parks. Nairobi National Park is literally right on the boundary of the city. You can stand in the national park and see the city sky strike scrapers. I suspect that the majority of visitors to that park are not Kenyan. The vast majority of people who visit that site would be in the park are overseas visitors. So you've got that sort of issue of people in, in countries like Kenya being quite disconnected from, the, from their own nature and driving probably many of the issues that we face here. And of course, the other marvel, fantastic thing about being part of AWA from the point of view of, of the BirdLife family is that, you know, we 126 countries. I don't know how that many languages that converts into, but on the assumption that we're going to work across the whole of the world on this, there is this extraordinarily rich resource of language. And some fascinating issues, such as the fact that if you map areas of biological diversity, where the most important places for birds and other nature are, we find they are also areas of cultural diversity, of linguistic diversity. And we finding that there's a strong relationship between decline on biological diversity and cultural diversity if you manage it, if you measure it as language. So there's some really important issues about the relationship between um, nature and culture, basically. And again, if you go right back to the UK, we were talking just before we started the discussion about 
bird, the corn crake, which is a, was a very common bird in the countryside, has now gone from Wales completely. But um, Daniel, in his list, of, there is a, there's a wonderful selection of, of what are Welsh names for corn crake. And of course, they couldn't exist in a place where the bird was extinct. And I think it's that sort of powerful link between nature and culture that we're really concerned about. And we feel that we're as a window onto that. Mm -hmm. No, the, the corn crake, um, uh, anybody interested in, in Welsh bird names, I really highly recommend this book. I think it's out of print at the moment, but it's uh, uh, Corn Creek is, uh, is a name with, it's, it's got so many names here compared to, to, to most of the birds. Uh, most of them are, are kind of on our pig. Uh, for you with a, with a kind of core and corn pig, the crex, crex, core and corn pig. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's just fascinating really that, that this is actually the name, names kind of where they've got names in towns in Wales. So in, in Llangevny, for example, if you the town right in the middle of Anglesey. It's got its own name, Regan Reed, for, for, for a corn creek. Uh, whereas, you know, there's uh, Frenchia on the other side of the North Coast Coast, it's got a, it's got a different name. Uh, so Regan Reed, again, is an on a name. Mm -hmm. um, but that, um, that even with such a simple call as cracks, 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 if anybody's ever heard of corn creek, it's a bit like a kind of a, a, a comb, is it? Kind of, you, you call it this sort of comb. Is that different communities interpret that call differently and have that slightly different kind of on a on a name to it, which is which is fascinating. And and they often sing at night, don't they? Because uh, people complain about uh, corn crates keeping yeah. them away. Yeah. There, there was a, that uh, piece in Three Men in the Boat um, of uh, so. You know, three men in the boat go, go up the Thames basically, and there's a corn crake. This is in the 1880s, I think. Yes, yeah. um, there's a corn crake keeping them awake. Well, there hasn't been a corn crake anywhere near the Thames for you know, no, about 100 right. years. Lost throughout England, recently reintroduced yeah. by the RSPB, but lost throughout England, but again, folk names, yeah. wide uh, okay. English folk names. One of the interesting names um, is it's not the most pleasant of, of calls, is it really, especially if you use it really at 3 o'clock in the morning, but one of the calls is a uh, um, uh, Tregadarik, which is a rig is a square, so it's kind of <laughs> the, the kind of that kind of goes up through the night. It's just kind of as if somebody's swearing at you all the time. Lots of the lots of the names here. Kind of, we've got the word swear in it. It's probably it might not actually be the swear. The bird, the bird in the in the cornfield that I'm swearing at, yes. for keeping me awake. Yes, that's, that's very interesting. Yes, I think it's, it's it's worth mentioning also. And John, John talked about the the correspondence, the correlation between uh, biodiversity loss and, and uh, cultural loss, uh, linguistic diversity, um, that in 2007 the United Nations Environment Programme uh, recognised, formally recognised cultural diversity, human cultural diversity as part of biodiversity. So it's not surprising that they're, that they're, they're going the same way because one is part of the other. Yeah. So, so we're actually seeing the same the same processes. And we're becoming a standardised world where there's just one name for kind of each species and not yes. for the Latin name. And the, the evolution of bird names in Wales, uh, and I assume we're kind of across uh, uh, most of the kind of developing countries or developed countries, has stopped. Yes. Completely stopped. Uh, at, the, at the risk of, of being taken to court. But, but, it's, but the word is word in the culture, the McDonaldization. Yeah. Of, <laughs> of, um, of bird names of, of everything. Another, another, another interesting element I think Andy and Shree talked about quite a lot, but which birds bring this wonderful, um, what well, they migrate basically. So they're, they're, they're international in their, in their scope, and so the, the, the sense of, of, of conservation very much is transboundary. And one of the lovely things I think about the about you were and the emergence of, uh, of, of names is if you take a species like yellow wagtail, which is a, you know, what was at least and still is a reasonably regular summer migrant to the UK and certainly across much of Europe, it's very diverse. When these birds arrive in in um, in East Africa on their winter migration, they have names there. So if you think of a yellow wagtail as a harbinger of spring in in Europe. 
in northern Kenya for the Moran people. It's called Hegelele, which basically means bringer of the rains. So it is a it is a messenger of seasonal change, both in the north, as it were, and in the south of its range. So I think there are some really beautiful um, elements to understanding these names and cultural responses to them, which will connect people around similar concerns. And of course, if you think about it as further as environmental indicators, and you think about people coping with climate change, particularly in arid and semi-arid areas, all of these issues associated with rain pattern and changing rain patterns over time also very interestingly connected to the uh, knowledge of the seasonal change in persons. I think it's also um, important to say something in, in connection with uh, Iwa about the thinking around a shifting culture within the conservation community itself. So rather than, if, if we say 100 years ago, uh, if you think of the, the, the national parks, or 150 years ago, the national parks were very much um, a sort of top-down approach. So well, we're going to conserve nature and, and hopefully well, we'll, we'll move the humans out of the way. And um, uh, but rather than um, sort of imposing a conservation on people, uh, what increasingly is, is being realised, and and the the names, for example, the ethnobiology, uh, really shouts this uh, very loudly, is, is that the people who best know how to conserve nature in their local area are actually the people who are living there, living with nature, uh, living from nature mm -hmm. as well, um, and and have been doing so f doing so for hundreds or thousands of years, yeah. and. Uh, John, would you <laughs> like to say something about that? It's sort of setting you up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I think rather as, as, um, as Daniel described the RSPB at the beginning, that you know, both the RSPB and both like more widely, we've been, we've been driven very much by a science agenda. And I think you know, that, that agenda has been very successful in many respects, I and mean, it's led to the development of protected area networks and so on and so on. But certainly in many areas, I think we feel that purely taking a scientific perspective on this is not capturing the hearts and minds of communities. And so we feel very strongly that an arts or a cultural response to nature is, is fundamental in, in drawing in new audiences and actually allowing perhaps the decline in the species to make more sense to people. If it links much more to their personal experience and to their, their fears perhaps for the loss of, of their cultural identity. Um, that that will be that will, that will resonate much more strongly than a classical science argument. And actually, you know, ironically, if you go to a science meeting, which I mean to many as, as we all have, um, often if you ask people two or three years after the science meeting what it was that they most remember about it, they will talk about the um, they'll talk about the performance of songs by children in the, in the lunch break or a reading by a distinguished poet like I think Julian Clark is reading today, this, this afternoon, you know, the National Poet. Uh, uh, the, that resonates incredibly strongly with people, whether they're scientists, whether they're artists or whatever. And this, this ability of artists and authors to um, distill their, their love of nature or uh, concern for the environment is, is, is a very powerful form of advocacy for us. So yeah, I mean, I think certainly across the whole of my family, there's a much greater commitment to continuing to work with the scientific community. Absolutely, that remains a fundamental part of what we do, but embracing a much wider look. Kind of breaking down this sort of barrier that sometimes is perceived to exist between the arts and sciences, which is entirely false. Yeah. And, and, and between between communities, and that's between yeah. conservation community and yeah, what I call real people, you know, the people out there. So it, 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 e work is is a part of uh, something that's giving a voice to to uh, people. We'll, we'll give a voice to people to say what they think Absolutely. about uh, birds. Um, so I think at this this point it'd be really good to. to Bring in some of the. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you want to come and come and join us here. No, no, no. Okay. I'll just. Yeah, please ask, ask questions. Or. You know, we're talking about the uh, decrease of biodiversity and the decrease in yes. language diversity. Sorry, could you could you just ask that in the latter voice? It's a recording. We would love to get that on. Um, 
hope, hopefully the you know the Aboriginal people uh, again teaching grammar with sec eggs here, but they have really held on to a considerable amount of that, that knowledge, haven't they? Some, some have, some, some have. have. Yeah. It's the same thing like everywhere else, isn't it? Once you come into the more urban setting, you yeah. do tend to lose a lot of that. But, um, but there are language things, you know, yeah. kind of Kelpie and all those there's so much knowledge in the, you know, just what you're saying, so much knowledge in yes. the language. And if the language gets lost, you've lost yeah. loads of names. Of the, the way you were describing it in terms of the, what was happening to the land, it was kind of a monoculture, wasn't it? And I think we're almost, well, we're already there, I think, mm -hmm. in terms of linguistically, we're, we're heading for a monoculture. Yeah. Um, you know, and the, the two things, um, uh, kind of side by side, really, the, the knowledge of the land, is um, so delighted to hear that some um, uh, Aboriginal groups still hold on to, to that knowledge. I think in here in Wales, uh, if, if we need to go back to the way we worked 100 years ago, there's nobody left with that knowledge, mm -hmm. with that connection with, with their uh, land yes. um, that could actually deliver that. Mm -hmm. so, in, uh, in their province of Italy, they think 300 languages and they think they're going to end up only saving 25, like recording. Yeah, that's why it's so important to kind of to, to archive these. Uh, well, that's right. Here, where it's Welsh people's names, isn't it? I mean, uh, we were discussing yesterday that the if you, if you go over to the National Museum of Wales, National the Folk Museum of Wales, uh, they've actually uh, recorded accents, mm -hmm. Welsh people's accents, mm -hmm. um, so that the accents don't become extinct because. We're talking about biodiversity kind of extinction. We're talking about you know uh, linguistically and uh, accent wise. We have extinctions going on right here in Wales as well. In dialects, you know. Like yeah, the dialects. Yeah. We live up in Dogefly, and we always say like, you know, there's a Bella dialect, the Dogefly right. one. But then we also think that in Dogefly, you know, there's like what we call a cross keys Tevin yeah. dialect, and you know, so you just have all these different dialects. And I think they're really important to say. And years gone by, probably one side of the would have called one species of bird one thing, and the other side would have called yeah. something else. You know, and we've got a record of that. This is obviously where Eva comes in, and, and we need to, to archive this. You know, the type of the knowledge of birds uh, here in Wales. Uh, I think we've probably got less than a generation left to be able to kind of corral that knowledge mm -hmm. uh, and to be able to archive it successfully. Mm -hmm. um, and I, think, I mean, that's very true worldwide, I think. I mean, we've talked about it a bit. And also, the other thing is that, realistically, time is not on our side, too, because so many of these languages are in oral traditions. They're not written down mm -hmm. anyway. So they're essentially in the, in the brains of the older generation. So I think there is a sense of the time ticking away a really massive opportunity. And one of the things I think we're, we're very interested in anyway is, is catalyzing a conversation between young people and their grandparents or their great grandparents. And this is a really interesting area of exchange. And my I'm actually working again in Kenya quite a lot. A lot of the young students that I've worked with now in their twenties are doing sort of undergraduate or master's degrees have been trained very much in a sort of Western education tradition. If you start encouraging them to go home and talk to their grandparents about their traditional knowledge, they, it reveals things to them themselves and allows them to contextualize their own education in an entirely new way. So although we have this sort of false impression sometimes, I think, that in um, countries like many sub-Saharan countries, sub-Saharan African countries, people will have this innate knowledge. Again, that's being lost in those places as well. Often as a result of entirely aspirational education programs, it's disconnecting people from their own, their own traditional knowledge. I have to say it's a really exciting element of, of the, the archive um, because birds birds are bringing all of this together. And what's interesting about birds is they migrate, they connect people mm -hmm. from the beginning. But then what you're getting through that is this geographic information, linguistic information, this is cultural information. That it, it's all coming together on this theme, but there's so much growth in that. It, it's a catalog of these languages as well. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I ask? Of course. Yeah, but, uh, I, I just want to mention that, that uh, Karen Park is linguist on the EWA, the EWA project, so she's uh, part of the team. But I just want, wanted to say that, that uh, being able to um, archive and, and present to the world yeah. oral histories, so elderly people talking, uh, talking to Karen Park, you know, uh, about their their own experience of birds and nature when they were children. 
whether they can read or, or not. Mm -hmm. you know? And we're excited that, that people might be able to access oral histories by their grandparents or their great grandparents you know, in, in time. Um, to, to hear the, the stories that um, you know, they can't get first hand because the, the, those people have, have passed away. You know? it's, it's really important um, connections. Um, so oral histories we think is a really powerful um, thing to, to capture on anyway. So the, the language centers in Australia, the Aboriginal language centers, is, that's what they're doing. They have, mm -hmm. They're trying to archive all these stories. And especially because the painting so strong in Australia, they are getting the images yeah. to go with that. And but they also have sections which are you know, only relevant to your language group or your gender. Yes, yes, sort of yes, yes. Yes. And um, I think, you know, it's a really good program that offers funding. Yes. Yeah. And a couple of people wanted to ask, ask questions. Yeah, I just had a question. It might be a silly question. But you were talking about dialects and different languages. And I think that's the main thing that people are struggling with at the moment. Is there much research in terms of dialects of birds and whether that's something Yes. Um, shall I? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there, there is quite a lot, and, and, and the, the, the first um, the first studies that, that come to mind. Um, so, in the 19th century, in an attempt to make New Zealand feel more like home, which was basically Oxfordshire, uh, um, uh, British people introduced a load of, of uh, British birds, and um, half the species didn't actually survive. Um, but uh, I think Chaffinch was one that, that did, and there's been a lot of research on how their, their songs have evolved uh, in New Zealand, you know, thousands of miles away from their, their sort of um, original populations. Um, so there has, been, there has been quite a lot of uh, research on that. Yeah, um, I was saying anecdotally, Chaffinch, you just have to mention Chaffinch, so I'm very familiar with the Chaffinch here today. Uh, I was over in Amsterdam a couple of years ago and I heard a song and I went, oh, that sounds like a chaffinch. I don't know what that is. So I went out and looked at it and went, it's a chaffinch. <laughs> it was a Dutch chaffinch. Anyway, so it didn't sing like, like a Welsh chaffinch. Anyway, Welsh chaffinch was, of course, a final songster. But, <laughs> but, you know, but there, there was that subtle difference. And I heard it's a very subtle difference as well but between a, a, a wren's core in, in, in um, Amsterdam in a, in a city park in Amsterdam and, and was a year you know the kind of very very simple. But that was just my year really, so um, yeah, it must be. And there's there there is uh, um, recent studies of uh, how song is evolving in this country, for example. Uh, so we did a, a little study in Oxford that discovered that the great tits living next to a main road in Oxford sang a different song on uh, a Sunday morning from on a Monday morning because on the Monday morning there was all the traffic and uh, so they had to sing something louder and more sort of forceful and truncated on a Monday morning but on Sundays when it was quiet they sang something else so a sort of weekend effect not, not saying they necessarily knew it was a Sunday but they knew it was quiet <laughs> and, and they were adapting to that and, and there's been a broader study just, just a Welsh connection there's been a broader study very similar um, uh, much more extensive done uh, by researchers in other respects. Yeah. Yeah. Was there much difference between the English Chaffinch and the New Zealand? The uh, they're still, they're still recognised in Chaffinches, but there are there are some distinct difference. differences here. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to bring us back to just where we were just before that in terms of uh, <coughs> um, kind of a loss, the potential of the of there being a lost generation. So we've got this generation now that we've got that um, we need to be able to archive all this knowledge you know, and store it somewhere be before it disappears. Is, um, I've been working for the ASPE for three years. I've been a professional bird watcher for the last time I was that um, and, and I remember curlews everywhere uh, when I was growing up. And um, I hadn't realised until I uh, started working for the ASPE in Wales about you know, the, the, the catastrophic declines in curlews in Wales in, in recent years. So just so you know, um, you know, we've lost, well, the official figures is around about 75% of our current use of birds, breeding current use of birds. Uh, I think the RSB thinks it's higher than that, but we just haven't got the biggest figures. I don't think the guys we've got out uh, uh, on our, um, 
by the ground, I think that we've probably lost nine or ten curlews. Uh, I was speaking to one of these guys who's been charged with trying to rescue a curlew in Wales for a job. You know? um, and he told me that he said, we've got, we've got a generation to do this, he said. Because if we, if, if we don't do this within a generation, um, the, the old folk, the guys who used to farm the land, the ones who used to see the curlews uh, coming back every spring, you know, they'll be gone. And the children won't have seen them, the guys who are going to be farming the land in the future. And they're going to say, they're just going to shrug the shoulders and say, why do I need to farm my land in such a way to get a curly back? I've never had a curly. You know I mean? on my land. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just looking here at the number of names. You, you can see really, in, just in this book, where um, birds really have uh, formed, you know, been a, an important part of people's lives in, in here in Wales because they're the ones with the most number of names. You know? So just looking at a, a, a curly, the Welsh name for a curly was uh, Galvina, which is a long bill. That's what it says. But ten doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but then you look at this. Cornet is the wine. Yarli, Kurbano, the Malay, Kurli, Kurli, Kurbano, Kuli, or Kurli, Kurbano. It's wrong. It is a matter of an automatic peak, if I could say it. Um, Peggy Peer 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 Peggy Longbill. Uh, that's in Penfield, so that's not very far from from Rochester. That's in Penfield, so that's what it's called there. And then Kunebre, um, the dogs of April. Because obviously these, the curlews came back to, to breed on the infants uh, um, during the uh, uh, during spring. And just just a list of names, a list of names, also lists where the curlew kind of uh, this is a very important part of people's lives. Uh, and we're about to lose them. Um, so you know, let's get all the stories and all the names of the curlews in it. Can I just, just mention it was picking up on the, the Peggy Longbill? Yeah. Um, so a very widespread tradition uh, that you find in, in the English folk names as well. So there's something like 3,300 English folk names for 78 passerine birds. Uh, that's just the English folk names. And 8% of them have a Christian name attached like Peggy or, or Polly Dishwasher for the Pied Wagger. And if you think that, that uh, these names were mostly collected in the 19th century, they, they always have a diminutive form, so it's Peggy, Polly, you know, Jenny, not Jennifer Wren, it's a Jenny Wren. So it's a diminutive form, in other words, it's, it's a very intimate, it's a, it's a child's name. Um, so those names actually make the birds part of the family, it's recognising them as part of the family. And this is in a culture that would have been deferential to, you wouldn't call somebody by their first name. You would never have had, if, if email existed in the 19th century, you would never have an email from someone you didn't know on the other side of the planet saying, hi Andy. It just wouldn't be, you know, it would be Mr. Dr. Ware, you know. Um, so, so it's really saying something about the intimacy of relationships that people have with birds. And I think it's probably about teaching the bird names. It's especially the common birds around uh, the home or the farm. Um, this is part of the culture of teaching the birds to the children. Yeah. Well, this is Jenny Wren, this is Polly Dishwasher, this is Bobby Bobby. Yeah. And, and I think going back to the question I, I put to Daniel much earlier on, is that how do we help people to reconnect? Well, I think we can learn a lot from how people connected in the past through how, how they transmitted their, their names and talk the birds, etc., to their children, um, yeah. is, is through that kind oh, yeah. of naming. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. And, and they can coin their own names. The beauty of the folk tradition is you don't, you, you don't have to be told, that is Bobby Robin and you must call it that. No, you can call it anything you like, you know, yeah. so long as you know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also interesting, isn't it, when you, when you examine the data like you've been collecting on, on undergraduates, okay. where you do find the students who do have a knowledge, and then you scratch the surface of that knowledge and ask them about it, it'll often be that they all respond by saying, well, I had a mentor or some sort. Yes. So I had a sibling, or I had a mother, or I had a grandfather. It's parents and grandparents especially. Particularly, yeah. and so this, 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 um, this is a critical element of it, because catching people young, often because there's somebody else in their family, or their extended family, who has a love of nature, and they inspire that. And I think that goes back to what you were saying, is that catching kids young, when they're really, they, 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 they have no fear, no concern, they're just extraordinarily excited about their encounters with nature. And which, I mean, no, I don't know about it. And certainly for me, that's where it came from. In my case, it was my father. Yeah. And I 
think you know it's those sorts of relationships and, and building those. We have to develop our next generation, so we have to kind of the parents of the future will hopefully be the case that we're, 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 um, we're trying to inspire on our reserves and our reserves at the moment. We should see children turning up to our reserves as we've got a reserve in, in legal weapons here, and the kids very often trudge along. You know, they be there. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> look at the teachers, and the teachers don't want to be there. Right? <laughs> yeah, they have to do it because it's part of their curriculum. And every one of them has got a, a you know, and goes off with a hop and skip when they leave the reserve. The smiles on their faces when they've had the experience. They kind of they trudge in, and they just skip out. That's incredible. But um, the other thing is, is, is the question really is, is uh, you can appreciate nature, I think, without having to put a label on it. It's, what some, it's, it's like a starting off point. Um, the, um, I was questioned on the phone in about six months ago, and uh, there was similar research about you know, young people don't know a magpie, they can't name a magpie. And I was saying, okay, um, it's more important that they see magpies uh, and similar birds in the, in the research uh, and enjoy them than having to put a label on them, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, yeah, but to me it was uh, I just said you that sort of yesterday it was that yeah. ability to put a name. So I had a great set of birds when I was about seven years old, sitting right next to me, and I couldn't put a name to it. And it was the actual naming, finding out what the name of that bird was, the switch that flipped in my head. Yes, but this led, well, led to me sitting here today. I, I think I think it makes a really profound difference yeah. to people. Um, it, going out in the morning and uh, if they notice birds on, oh it's birds on, or, or oh there's a robin scene, there's a blackbird, there's a pie like that. Yeah, yeah. J just it's, but it's being that, immersed in that is... Yes, it's, it's an appreciation of it. I think you can appreciate the birds, as long as you appreciate the birds song, you don't need to put a label on it. it, it what I always say to people when I need bird walks is try and learn the name of the bird that you are calling because if you can, it will add so much value. Yes. I think it's a step process. Mm -hmm. First of all, yes. people going out, they're, hearing, they're not even hearing it. No, no, so no, they're no. going out, they've got to hear it. The second step is they've got to then appreciate it. Yes. And then they can, if they, because then they need to appreciate that this is adding value to their life. And then if they can put that name on the bird, so they can say, that's a song fish, without having to see it. And, and, and part, of, part of the issue uh, in this country, certainly, and, and by this country, may I, the, the United Kingdom. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, it is that so many people are actually plugged into a, an iPhone or something that you know, they're, they're, they're just, I don't know what they're listening to, but they're not connecting at all with their environment. They're getting run over by cars. Um, well, that's that's the trivial issue, but they're not noticing long tail tips and robins and, and things. You know, there's a more serious <laughs> point <laughs> in their wider environment. They just, they, they've, they've reduced their experience down to whatever they're listening to on the phone. It's um, not a mobile phone app yet that picks up what's singing and says, oh, it's a blackbird. Yeah, there well, there's a, wonderful, <laughs> there's a wonderful RSPB app that <laughs> advertising for them. £4.99, I mean. Yeah. Uh, RSPB app that, that has all British birds and their songs, and um, that, I've got it for helping to teach yeah. people bird songs. And it it up? I mean, I, if I'm sitting, tuned into my phone, and the song is singing, and I'm not listening, and you're saying, we need to break well, into that. Well, yeah. you like to get jerked up in my phone. It's the, a blackbird. Oh, like, yeah. oh, well. Yeah. We interrupted the programming. Yeah, bring you yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, well, that's really interesting. Well, that's, uh, certainly, there's a. Uh, uh, every so often, the, the sort of um, techno boffins come along and say, "Oh, we're, we're designing something that you can you can hold your phone up to record a bird, and it'll tell you what it is." Well, you know, if you if you know bird song, you know that nine times out of ten, it's going to get it wrong anyway. But the point is, what what concerns me about that is it's putting another bit of technology between between the bird and the observer. Uh, it's saying that you don't. Yeah, no, 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 no I agree. I, I, th I think what you're what you're suggesting would, would be, uh, yeah. It's it's important because there is a fact that we're living in a highly uh, in in a world that is is so um, well just drawn into this technology and how how to to connect with the, the youth. How are we going to, do we need to bring that, make that a part of what we're doing? It's a challenge. Absolutely. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I think it's a challenge, but it's actually also interesting, and I think it's something that, again, kids are deeply fascinated by, and there's a real opportunity to use the, the, uh, the availability of, of, of uh, smartphones, video, audio recording, for them to go out and capture these stories for themselves. So that brings in a really interesting element. I mean, both pretty much, I, I don't know how many people in this room have smartphones in their pockets, but I suspect several of us do, if not the majority. 
and you can now use those to go out and make these little snips of video or audio, capture those, and one of the things we want the, the, um, the EWA to, to be is a place, a depository of, 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 the, of this information, which can be captured increasingly easily. And again, one of the fascinating things about working in, 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 in Kenya is that the adoption of mobile phones in that community is incredibly rapid. Partly because the landline system is so poor, so everybody's moved straight onto mobile. <laughs> yes. But it's interesting seeing how that's being adapted and used. And again, it was formed very much to the whole rationale of behind you know, what we're all here for, which is talking about connected communities and digital transformations. I mean, these are really fundamental aspects of what we think we can bring in. And we're increasingly um, thinking that a mobile app for EWA um, is, uh, is not a luxury, it will be an essential thing. Even if we need a, a word to our sponsors, even if we need another grant to develop <laughs> that. Um, I'm just kind of conscious of time, I'm not sure how we are. Oh, is it? We've got an app. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Yes. Yeah, so there was a question here. Okay. Yeah. But I was just going to say that I um, I grew up in a family of bird lovers and bird watchers, um, and as a kid, I was like you said, surrounded by people saying, "Well, that's the to I don't play with. That's a thrush." Um, and and I wasn't against that, but I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't really keep it up. You know, I was like, "Oh, birds are good." And then, and then birds were boring for a while, and it's only now in in my early thirties that I've actually rediscovered it a lot, and I'm and I'm relearning what all the birds are, which is made possible because of that. But yes. I don't think it's necessarily. I think when you start forcing kids to learn things, then that yeah, no, 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 no. can put them off. So I think That's you're totally right. right in what you say about, right. about just giving them a love of nature and appreciation for it, and then when they want to come back to learning it later on, like I find that a lot of my friends have gone through a similar. And I think I think it's also giving giving children permission to be because there are people out there. I mean. Who think it's geeky yeah. uh, to, to know birds and like, like birds? Yeah. And if that's part of the youth culture that, that this is geeky, well, then they need to be given permission yeah, exactly. uh, to be geeky. Mm -hmm. um, God, this isn't geeky. But, but I, I think it's very, very important what you say, say about not being forced to learn the thing. Uh, what John mentioned, that, that is a reference to my own research, that um, we find that uh, students who do have a, a good uh, folk knowledge, <laughs> a natural history knowledge. Mm -hmm. They they learnt it from their parents, the grandparents, from friends, from relatives, whatever. And those who tipped teacher, either in a formal or informal capacity, as as a source of knowledge, did slightly worse on average than those who didn't. Uh, not so significantly worse, but it but it was worse. So the best you can say for formal education in this is it, it does no harm, yeah. but it but it adds adds nothing, yeah. and it's really reinforcing what what you're saying. Yeah. That it, it just has to be part of the culture that's gently yeah. saying, no, oh, this is it's okay, this is good. And that's why it's so important to be collecting the things you're collecting because I did it with my dad is a big lover of ships and I was never interested in ships at all when I was younger, and I, I, I was my brother. Um, but now I'm suddenly like, well, he had all that knowledge that we never tapped into and feel slightly guilty about it because it's much easier to learn when you're that age. But we just weren't interested. Um, but, but finding ways to archive it so that when you come to that interest, you mm -hmm. still have those voices to, yes. to listen to is really, really important. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Yes. Well, I'm here. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Um, to to, 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 to you, oh, oh. Um, in, in terms of the learning, do because because there's a culture, a small world, but a culture in Wales of, of people actually having bird names. So the other way around. So you were yes, that is something that in my head you talk about Peggy and Jenny yeah. Wren. Yeah. Like that. So Klinos is one of the most popular names for uh, girl women in, in, in Wales. And Klinos is a finch. So a green finch is a Klinos, Klinos well, a green finch. And Linnet is just a, a Thenos. You've got Headed, I mean for, for a fellow, just a Headed comes from Skybar. I know somebody called Tello. Tello is, is the is Warbler, so the Tello Coy is Wood Warbler, the Tello Kiss is Reed Warbler, etc. Mm -hmm. And is that, you know, do you have that uh, in Sub Saharan Africa, for example, so that you have um, 
people were actually called after birth. Well, I don't think. Yes, came first. The chicken and the egg, in terms of did the name come for the person come first, or did the did the name? Yeah. Well, 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 yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> it's very widespread. It's very widespread. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was thinking that talking to Ugandan colleagues recently that about the Uganda Kingdom, that certainly the clans within the Uganda Kingdom all have totems that are birds. So many of the totems of the clans are birds, okay. uh, like crown cranes or or, or, or those things. But I mean, I, the 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 um, Nigerian, Nigerian, the Lithuanian song. I'm sorry, uh, sorry Latvian. La 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 yes, as well. yes. So um, we have a colleague, an ornithologist colleague, whose name is Maris Strast, if I can pronounce it right. If he's listening, I'm apologies. <laughs> uh, but his surname means song thrush, and apparently. <laughs> Um, something like 70%, he told me, so, you know, if this is wrong, then great, great nice, but, uh, of Latvian surnames are bird names, and that is because they took the name of the farm when they settled, you know, traditionally, and the farm was named after a bird, presumably a bird that was on that farm, so I think there's a significant number of people, the, the sort of Smith equivalent in Latvian is Cavagelli or something. Um, <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and, that, and that, 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 that roots um, the significance of birds very deeply in the culture. Um, but what Maris is, is researching is, is how that's sort of getting a drift from the land and from the birds themselves now in a, in a culture that, that, that uh, communities are becoming increasingly urbanised and people are disconnected from the land as they are right across Europe. Um, and. Um, uh, so they know sort of well birds are significant to the culture, but they don't actually know any birds. So they go to the internet, and now um, there, there are brands. So a, a lot of Latvian, you know, manufactured brands are bird names, but they're penguin, hummingbird, ostrich. You know, it's just yeah. uh, kind of there's something there, but it's quite yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 the example John was uh, alluding to, I did a little bit of work with uh, students in uh, Nigeria and asked them to, to tell me stories about birds and, and um, uh, one student told me that in her village, and I don't know what, uh, what language group this, this was, uh, but a lot of people named, um, named a child after weaver birds because they were industrious. Ah. So, you know, they're, they're picking up sort of um, uh, virtuous attributes, you know, they, they, they have aspirations for the children that are based on what they see the birds do, which is uh, a nice It's also a very nice, that, that, that rather nice story we were talking about before about the, the use of um, diminutives like Jenny and so on, being about the relation bit being quite intimate. And again, in an African context, if you think about weaver birds, the fact that so many weaver birds nest in villages or beside houses and so on, so you Again, you have this very intimate relationship with birds in all of these communities, and I'm sure that's represented in things like, like, like naming. So I think that that's, that is a, I mean, that is a key, key, key issue to that intimacy. And one of, I mean, I think I don't know whether uh, we feel that one of the striking things about being here yesterday and today already has been the fact that when we talk to people, it, it's. it's Almost everybody will relate to a bird story of their own. Everybody will have a story. Uh, it's quite extraordinary how birds seem to open up that conversation, which for us, from a wonderful point of view, quite apart from the stories themselves, relate opens up the potential for a much wider conversation about nature and the environment and environmental change. It's a, for, you know, as an environmentalist or a conservationist, it's. The, the, the value of birds as indicators, as ways into this wider conversation, is extremely powerful. I think, I think we're discovering, we've been discovering before, it, but we've discovered very powerfully. Very in the last powerfully, yeah, it's been, been a, a, exciting. You know, people are asking, well, what do you do? In, say, your ethnomythology world archive, and what's that? Well, we're connecting communities of birds and people, and, that, and that they, they light up and tell you a story. Yeah. Um, just, just just one other comment, just building on that, John, um, the way that it also opens up connections with all disciplines. So just thinking about the weaver bird, where I work in Paraguay, it, the weaver bird's highly respected as a woman who teaches how to weave. And weaving is, is the essential technology for the Ajayo people in that they're mobile. So having something to carry your stuff in is really important. I mean, it's going to carry your babies in is really 
really important. And um, so you have this link not only with history and literature and all, you know, all those disciplines, but also with human thinking about human evolution and how people how people evolved their knowledge of different technologies and very likely, you know, it's happening now, so and very likely in the past as well, people learned technologies from watching animals, from watching birds. And so those, you know, it's not it, it's really a two-way the respect is it's not imagined or um, spurious, it's really it's actually they are our teachers as well, yes. you know, yes. in so many ways. Yes, and people very often say, well, how did people know that something was poisoned? Did they have to eat it and die and say, well, what did he eat? No, they watched the animals. Mm -hmm. yeah, watch, watch, watch mm -hmm. other, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily want to be watching birds because pheasants eat dead in nightshade. Mm -hmm. Fairies are <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Bears. what the berry is for, is exactly. to be birds is birds. So they don't believe everything you see birds doing, but, um, but yes, it's watching, it's having that intimate connection. Mm. So I guess we're probably uh, pretty well on time. I uh, just want to thank all of you for your contributions. Thank Daniel and John uh, for uh, really lifting, keep, keeping this uh, a, a good uh, conversation. And um, Can I just add that if there's anyone in the audience who feels like they would like to talk about this further, we would love to do an interview with you. We've got um, a little bit of video technology and audio technology. So if you find us at the booth, we would be really happy to just um, talk to you further about your interests, your experience, any stories you have, etc. And we've got some handouts as well to keep you apprised of the project as we develop. Um, do you have those? We are short on handouts, but I have pen and paper, and we take down names and contact details so we can stay in touch. So I should, should just say, so Felice Winton is, is oh. the anthropologist on the, the EWA project. Um, just to thank everybody, if, if uh, you want a reminder of the, the nursery rhyme of Who Killed Cop Robin, uh, that's it. But uh, just uh, like in closing, to thank the AHRC actually for the Connected Communities Court because um, it's allowed us uh, to do this, it's allowed all these communities of researchers and people to, to get together in a really sort of powerful way. Uh, this festival is, is wonderful for us and everybody, everybody else. But, but I think the, the, the Connected Communities Program and Research Hall is a really inspirational thing. Um, and I don't think we'd be able to develop keyboard without it. So thank you.